hardly capable women have no idea that they might be suffering because they're so numb. A lot of the typical diagnosis symptoms do not apply to them. So for instance, a lot of highly functioning people, they might suffer from dysthemia, which is a longer, more drawn out and less mild version of depression. But because they're showing up to work, they're still grateful for the material and relational conditions in their lives. They think, I can't be depressed, but actually they may be carrying that depression. Well, hello there, and welcome to this episode of The Terry Cole Show. I just had a fascinating conversation with a repeat guest on The Terry Cole Show, Dr. Perpetua Neal, and she is an expert at type A overachieving um, women in particular, and at trauma bonding, and at abusive relationships. So we had so much to discuss, and about a lot of the misunderstandings that there are out there in the world around therapy speak and how both of us really do think that this is damaging to people's understanding of what is happening. She is a Simon & Schuster author. She is an insider expert at Forbes, Business Insider and Vogue. She consults for media campaigns. She writes for the Huffington Post. I see a lot of her stuff in the Mind Body Green. She writes for Thrive Global. Her work is in 41 languages and she works across six continent. She also advises at Stanford Business School's Neurodiversity Project. She is the University of Cambridge, 50 women in 50 years. She is also Mind Body Green's 20 cutting edge mental health leaders alongside Dr. Deepak Chopra and Daniel Amen. So I hope that you enjoy this interview as much as I enjoyed interviewing Dr. P again. I'm so excited to welcome back to the Terry Cole Show, Dr. Perpetua Neo one of my faves. Welcome back, Dr. P. Hey, Terry. Thank you so much for having me back. I'm very excited to be here today. Me too. We're always sort of aligned. You know, you'll reach out to me or you'll write an article or I'll see you (laughs) giving a talk somewhere in England or wherever. And we always end up, we're sort of vibing on the same stuff. The same same frequency. It's amazing. Yeah, Yeah. We are. So let's, I mean, I I was telling, um, I was talking Mm -hmm. at the top about, you know, all all the things, the many things that you've done. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk a little bit about sort of recently, um, and I've been writing about it and you've been writing about it. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about trauma bonding quite Mm -hmm. a bit. And Mm -hmm. I love how um, specifically, accurately, and succinctly you write, lecture, talk about this. So let's start with why is this an area that is interesting to you? Like what, what is your own backstory in respect to this? So my own backstory is obviously I'm a psychologist and I was a psychologist who didn't know that I was in an abusive relationship with a narcissist. So the thing about having, being in a toxic relationship as most people think, why doesn't she just get out? How come she's so stupid to stay there? And that's mm-hmm. exactly what I thought about relationships. You know, like if somebody is bad to me, I'm going to walk away. But then as the more I studied about it, the more I understand that these relationships are engineered to be on the slow burn. And by the time you realize you're so exhausted and your nervous system has become blunted. So it's Same your more. brain. Yes. So your brain and your entire, you know, like nervous chemistry is basically telling you, you got to stay. It's making you addicted even to the abuse. And the cycle, because th- that's the thing that when I, w- I was reading something that you recently, mm. you, you, we were talking about an article that you had written. Mm. And it's like the really likening it to addiction in yes. a different way where we're always in an abusive relationship where the highs are very high, the lows are very low. Mm-hmm. You've already had a, a taste of the bliss, so to speak. The mm-hmm. You feel like it could go back there. It's the same mm-hmm. thing with, I stopped drinking when I was like 21. Yeah. And it's like in your mind, like we mm-hmm. romanticize the high in oh, the totally. same way right? That that people in abusive relationships, we go back and think about the one time that it was amazing when we Mm -hmm. went to Paris and we selectively Mm -hmm. do not remember how then also in Paris, they tortured us about whatever it was, or do you know what I mean? Like there's selective memory 
Yeah. Where we're sort of looking through the pink glasses. Yeah. And I find it really interesting because the human brain is actually engineered to remember loss and remember negative things. But in a toxic relationship, somehow we selectively remember the great stuff and then we explain away and we minimize the bad stuff, which is disproportionately more intense and more frequent. That is interesting because if you think about the negativity bias that we have as human yeah. beings, mm -hmm. so, you know, we talk about that we remember painful, negative things mm -hmm. five times yeah. more readily yep. than positive. But that's mm -hmm. part of how we know that it's disordered thinking yeah. with abusive relationships and with addicted relationships. If mm -hmm. you think back to only the good times when you, when you were drinking or how, how mm -hmm. quote unquote much fun yeah. you are or you were mm -hmm. or it was, mm -hmm. and you're not thinking about the DUI that you had or you're not thinking about the relationships that yeah. split or the brutal fights that you had that you don't remember, but other people can't forget. Mm -hmm. Clearly there's something disordered about Definitely. that thought pattern. Yeah. But, you know, Dr. P, what do you think about the fact that it's like the whole world? I mean, you and I have been doing this for decades, mm -hmm. but it seems like the whole interweb has woken up to therapy speak. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of people who are not psychologists or licensed psychotherapists. Mm -hmm endlessly talking, quote unquote, and teaching about mm -hmm. this. So tell me your thoughts on this, because I know you have some. <laughs> I have very mixed feelings. On one hand, I am saying, great, people are starting to understand that mental health isn't just about being anxious or being depressed. No, it's not just about something generic. It's not about, um, it's, it's less of a stigma now. People are happy to say, hey, you know what, like I'm seeking treatment. Hey, today I'm not feeling very well. So I'm going to take a day off. That's nothing to do with just physical health. I think that's great. That's moving us in the right direction. But on the other hand, we are also cheapening mental health speak by using it as an excuse or twisting it. And we're making it feel very irresponsible. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Same. Well, I have two two different concerns. Well, many concerns, but two different yeah. concerns. One is that when lay people are labeling everyone in their life a narcissist or everyone who's doing something that they don't like yeah. as abusive or mm -hmm. triggering them or, oh, yes. again, the misuse. Like, it's funny. I very rarely, in my writing, in my books, in what I'm mm -hmm. talking about, if you get activated by something, mm -hmm. unless it's like a traumatic trigger, like mm -hmm. you're actually being triggered to a traumatic experience from an earlier time, mm -hmm. you're not triggered. So I don't yep. use the word triggered, right? Being activated, yeah. we could yep. be upset. Yep. A lot of times someone says something rude or mm -hmm. is being a friggin' jerk yep. and we're just upset. Yeah. You're not, every time you're, you're not, upset, you're not, <laughs> yeah. you're not. And yeah. I think it's, that the distinction mm -hmm. is not readily made. So why don't we in this conversation make it mm -hmm. that if you are actually triggered, what the therapeutic meaning of that is, mm -hmm. is that you're basically having a traumatic response mm -hmm. to something from an earlier experience yes. in your life. This is the description of post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. syndrome mm -hmm. is if it's active, it means a smell, a sound, the crashing of something, right? Mm -hmm. Some Someone closing a door too loud. But if yep. it provokes that sort of stuck trauma within you, you're triggered. You yep. may see the whole thing happen. You yep. may start, and then we know all of the physical things that yep. can happen from mm -hmm. that. But that, the real distinction in, in my estimation mm -hmm. is that is not the same as you having an unpleasant conversation with someone or even a fight with someone yep. and you being upset or crying or even hyperventilating, being very upset. Mm -hmm. You're just upset. Yep. You're upset. Yes. There was a stimulus and your reaction is that you're upset. But the thing about trauma isn't just what happened to you in the past. Trauma is how it continues to live on in your body. And because it yes. keeps living on over and over again, it's not the first time, it's the 10th time or the 100th time you're paying compound interest. Yeah, exactly. But do, do you find with what you're doing out there in the world yourself that what, what other 
stuff do we think is being sort of misused therapy wise? So the word being triggered. Mm -hmm. So we just made the distinction as to what that is. Mm -hmm. Uh, What else? I think the word gaslighting is completely perverted these days as well. So a little thing and someone would say, you're gaslighting me. And so suddenly everybody is going around accusing everybody else of doing something that's intentionally intentionally engineered to screw with your reality. And that mm-hmm. paints everybody with a very terrible brush because not everyone is going to have that intention. Right. So so looking at so let's be clear about mm-hmm. what the intention is yeah. with gaslighting. So mm-hmm. give me your two cents, I'll give you mine. So the intention of gaslighting is when somebody deliberately tries to mess with your sense of reality. Black is white, white is black. And yep. in the sense that you stop being able to trust yourself, you're disconnected from yourself as a ground. And because you don't have any anchor, you start believing this person, which makes it easier for them to trick you and to abuse you in future. Yes. So the purpose of gaslighting mm-hmm. is for the abuser to gain more control yes. over the victim. Yes. Right. I want you to be dependent on me. Mm-hmm. I will use different ways of mm-hmm. um, messing with your reality and then telling you, you know, I'm, I'm really worried about you, babe. Mm-hmm. You know, I wasn't going to say anything, but Bob also mm-hmm. said he was worried about you. Like, yep. there's so many different ways that an abuser can cleverly. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. Right. Get mm-hmm. you off, get you off your game. Yep. If we think about the origin mm-hmm. of gaslighting, there was a movie actually yeah. in the forties, I yeah. think. And then again, it was redone in the sixties. And then there was a more mm-hmm. recent one, like the girl mm-hmm. on the train, I think was the more modern one. Mm-hmm. And basically that storyline for those who don't know, I feel like most people do, but storyline was a husband who was intentionally trying to make his wife go crazy, question her reality the movie was called Gaslighting because it was back in the 30s and 40s when how you had light in your house was through yes. these gas lights. Yes. And so she was saying, he kept dimming the lights mm-hmm. and she was like, hello, are the lights lower now? Are the lights dimming? And he's like, no, you're losing it, basically. There was other other things he did within the movie too, to stole her brooch, did different things to mm-hmm. make her feel like she was losing her grasp on reality. But But... You know, Perpetua, I think that the important thing that you pointed out is that there's an intentionality yeah. to gaslighting. Yeah. That someone disagreeing with you, someone misremembering mm-hmm. something, yep. someone really thinking, I, I didn't say that. That's not what happened for me. This is what I said. Mm-hmm. Every disagreement you have with someone mm-hmm. does not mean that they're they've got some mastermind to try to manipulate the crap out of you. Yeah, right? it's not a concerted attack because when somebody deliberately gaslights you, it's not just once. It often is part of an engineered series where they actually want you to lose your sense of self-control and believe in yourself and become dependent. Whereas if I say, you know, that's not how I remembered it. That doesn't mean I want you to not trust yourself at all. It just means I remembered it wrongly. My body perceived it differently right. or... If you ever watched the, the show, The Rashomon Effect, the Jap- this really old Japanese show, pe- different people watching a certain event from different perspectives would remember it differently. And that's just the human experience. Right. What was the name of the show? The Rashomon Effect. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yes, I have heard of it. Yeah. I haven't seen it though. Yeah. Interesting. But I think that we're, we're making distinctions that yeah. are important. Yeah. So other, let's think of other terms that are out there that mm-hmm. people are talking about that are, I think, being misused. Mm-hmm. Um, I would. I say, mean, yeah. what what are what are in mm. your estimation? What are you seeing? I would say that one thing would be, I'm doing it for my mental health. I'm because I am X Y Z. I'm wired this way. I am an um, an introvert, so I can act like that. You know, sometimes. So a long time ago, I read this meme that you being an introvert does not give you license to be an asshole. And <laughs> right. I am an introvert myself. And I agree with that. Yes. Because sometimes I see I'm an empath. Therefore, I act like that. That's why I'm snapping out at you. I'm an introvert. Therefore, I'm snapping out at you. And that's no license. Mm. So in the same way, you know, like, yes, you could be feeling anxious and afraid to go out. It doesn't mean that it gives you a license to snap at a person and then not 
repair what has happened. Of course, you know, if you snap at a person and you feel really bad and then you repair, it's a different thing. Is that then that doesn't make you irresponsible. So, you know, like whatever we're feeling, whatever, however ways we are wired is not a license to behave that way. Yes. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Another thing I see all the time, Mm -hmm. because so much of my work in the past couple of years has been centered around boundaries, Mm -hmm. is people exactly what you just said about someone being like, well, I'm an introvert. That's why I did it. Mm -hmm. People saying, this is my boundary. Ah, yeah. When what they're describing is a manipulation mm. technique. Mm. It's it's a control, a desire to control yeah. the other person. Um, and I, I brought this up. We were talking about the Jonah Hill yes. situation mm-hmm. where online there was a whole thing where he was presenting. You guys know this story. If you're mm-hmm. watching or listening, Jonah Hill got involved with an amateur surfer, Sarah Brady. They were... You know, she came out a year or two after, a year and a half after they split, she came out sharing these text messages um, that went down between them and why they broke up. And it was basically him saying, I need you to take down these pictures on your Instagram. If you're the type of person who does this, I don't want to be with you. You can't hang out with women who are questionable. Mm -hmm. You can't have lunch with other surfer guys. You can't wear bathing suits on Instagram. All these things. Yep. And he kept saying, "And that's my boundary." These are my boundaries. Yes. Yeah. And you're like, "No, it's not. It's not your boundaries." And what blew my mind, Mm -hmm. you know, Doctor P, is that looking in, I couldn't even do it for long, Mm -hmm. but I very briefly Mm -hmm. jumped into some of the comment. Well, actually, one of the comment sections Mm -hmm. of, of like an article. Yeah. And how people were being like, he told her it was okay if she didn't agree. Mm-hmm. He, 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 he told her he has a right to his boundaries. You're like, no, no, that's not it. Yep. Yeah. My, my mm-hmm. two cents on, on that was if you look at, mm-hmm. you know, if we flip the script. Yep. And it would be like her mm-hmm. dating him for a year mm-hmm. and then saying, it's my boundary now that you don't have any romantic storylines in any of your movies going forward. Mm-hmm. That's my boundary. Mm-hmm. Would anyone think that was a boundary? Nope. People will think she's being hysterical and demanding and jealous and paranoid. Correct. Indeed. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was actually a good example yeah. of um, sort of what what is out there and what's happening. Another concept that you write about, and we both sort of write about mm-hmm. similar stuff, but I want to hear from you. Like your your demographic yeah. is the same as mine, which is mm-hmm. very high functioning women. Yeah. Now we speak to other people too, but generally speaking, and I guess mm-hmm. you, you attract sort of, not to say like we're highly capable, but we are, um, that you, you kind of attract <laughs> people yeah. who resonate yeah. with mm. you. So what do you, what is you what do you see are the pitfalls of highly capable women when it comes to mental health? Highly capable women have no idea that they might be suffering because they're so numb and that a lot of the typical diagnosis symptoms do not apply to them. So for instance, um, a lot of highly functioning people they might suffer from dysthemia, which is a longer, more drawn out and less mild version of depression. But because they're showing up to work, they're still grateful for the material and relational conditions in their lives. They think, I can't be depressed, but actually they may be carrying that depression. So in the same way with high functioning anxiety, they're still going to work, they're still doing really well, even though they technically are like Loch Ness, you know, like in Scotland, they look really calm and placid, but underneath Nessie is cavorting merrily. And that is actually (laughs) very, very difficult because the bigger the gulf between how your life looks and how it really is, the harder you're going to paddle to maintain that image. And the longer this persists, um, this gulf persists for, the harder it is for you because you get tired. Yeah. So, so part of what you talk about with mm-hmm. your work is yeah. the the big three mm-hmm. things yeah. that we tolerate. Yeah. So can we can we break those down? Sure. So the first one would be having a very busy mind, 
So, I mean, like type A women, we both know that our minds think a lot. Our minds are active. But then, you know, sometimes it can be a creative, active mind. Sometimes it can be a mind that's just worrying and worrying and worrying. And worrying is like a tumor, right? It starts somewhere and then it spreads everywhere. And from a very tiny issue, like, I don't know, about your laptop, it could met- metastasize into something about your finances or about the house blowing up. And worrying is irrational. And basically, a busy mind is basically like that. So if you know that a busy mind is working against you, if you're problem sleeping or when you sleep, you're not really sleeping, your brain is still really overactive, trying to, you know, sort out issues, but you're not really sorting out issues because worrying is not the same as problem solving. And then the second one that I often see is panic attacks. So, you know, panic attacks means uh, it's not worrying a lot. Okay, panic attacks is when Mm. you literally feel an alien has possessed your body. Okay, you start to convulse, your heart palpitates, um, you hyperventilate, your hands start to shake and sweat, and you get this crazy heat spreading down the back of your neck sometimes um, as well. So basically, it's a horrible experience, and it often is centralized um, around a certain kind of situation or venue. So some of my clients, they couldn't take planes, some of them couldn't take trains, some of them couldn't go to cafes anymore. And then they kind of just think, yeah, it's okay, I'll tolerate that. I, I just won't take I wouldn't go for holidays. You know, I even had a client who had to insist that his family only took local holidays and they had to drive in two cars just in case at any moment he got so anxious, he would just have to turn around and drive back. Mm. And he, so, so what do we hmm. do? Yeah. Like, like what, what do you do when you're in that situation where you have a, a mind that just won't quit? <laughs> okay, so you can have an active mind, but you can use the active mind for you. So one thing is to learn to keep regulating your brain so this is what we just call a three breath reset you don't need to breathe forever you don't have to go to long retreats what's most important is that you keep regulating it because when your amygdala your fear center takes over it doesn't care and if you don't fly on a plane with a hijacker knowingly you shouldn't be flying your brain and your life with your amygdala taking over so taking three deep breaths is actually one of the easiest ways to reset as long as you breathe correctly. Like for instance, before this call, I took three deep breaths. After this call, I will take three deep breaths. It essentially is my boundary, like my little like boundary zone between different things that I'm doing so that my brain is always mm. reset as much as possible. So when you say breathing the right way, mm-hmm. what does that look like? Okay, so breathing the right way is, imagine you put one hand on your belly, okay? And as you breathe in, Okay, tell me, is your stomach growing bigger like a balloon or is it going in? Mine's going out. Great. Then you're breathing correctly. And then when you breathe out, make sure that you are emptying your breath, your belly or breath, and breathe out for as long as you can. So don't be, you know, stingy about how long you take to breathe out, basically, because you got a lot of carbon dioxide, a lot of water vapor to let go of. And when you can do that, basically... You're doing your body a great service. And because a lot of times, you know, like fat is also excreted as carbon dioxide. So the more you breathe out, the better it is if you're trying to lose weight as well. Right on. Just just yeah. another benefit right there. I know. But there's something yeah. very, very doable mm-hmm. yeah. about the three breath yeah. rule. Like give yourself a minute mm-hmm. And and try. I mean, I use. For, you know, I I went and had my brain scanned. Oh, okay. By, do you know Doctor Daniel Amen? Yeah, I, I love his stuff. Yeah, yeah. He was like, "Come mm-hmm. and get your brain scanned." Mm-hmm. I was like, "Okay." So I I went to do his Instagram show, mm-hmm. and he what what my brain showed mm-hmm. um, was that it was like he literally said, "This might be the busiest brain I've ever seen in my." million years of doing this <laughs> i was like oh no <laughs> so it gave me all of these ideas mm-hmm. and this is with me having a dedicated meditation practice mm-hmm. working out every day of the week mm-hmm. like i do i walk in nature every day i do lots of things mm-hmm. too i've seen your trampoline this, stuff this. right you i've seen you on a trampoline <laughs> you know a yes. trampoline yeah. six out of seven days a week. yeah and then on Sunday, mm. i hike with my husband but what I, I find is that 
there's so much like like you said there there's different qualities of thinking yeah and that the the one that i've worked and i help my clients to get mm -hmm. away from yeah is the rumination yeah kind mm -hmm. Yep, because that I think is the kind that you're talking about that can metastasize, so to speak, totally. into yeah. these other areas. Mm -hmm. And what other things do you suggest with your highly capable clients, like ways to keep mental and physical health? Say no in check. That's why I prescribe boundary mm -hmm. boss to everybody. I'm like this do book, Terry Cole. You have to read it because the ability to say no is going to free up so much mental energy. And when you can do that, you, you start to realize, gosh, how much have I been carrying and dragging along every single day that I dread the next day? That helps a lot. And then, of course, you know, with the body, like I, like you, I love to take hikes. I run, I have a trump, I actually have two trampolines, one in my house, one in my parents' house. And you know, whatever you need to regulate your body and to stay fit, you know, stay fit in your body, stay fit in your brain. You know, I always say that mental fitness, winning the mental game is one of the most important things. And supplement wise, at the very basic, I always tell people, take magnesium citrate. The more stressful your life is right now, and it's okay to have a, a high, pay, a fast paced life, you know, especially if you work in certain industries. But if you're going through a, sure. a certain like fast paced season, like, you know, end of the fiscal year kind of thing, then pop a little bit more magnesium because your body is going to be depleted. And if you cannot support your body, you cannot support your brain. Full stop. Yes. I love it. I've been taking yeah. magnesium for years. Yeah. And, and what are your thoughts about, um, hormones, hormones. and about hormone replacement? So actually, I've been reading um, this book called Fast Like a Girl by Dr. Mindy Pels. And uh, yeah. it's made me respect my hormones for the first time in my life. <laughs> because like most high functioning women, I'm like, no, nope, my body's a machine. My body is an inconvenience. And damn, this hormone mm. is leading to this. If only I didn't have this issue. You know, like a number of people who laugh at me when I say that my body is an inconvenience. I just wear a dress because I don't have a thing. I don't have to match my clothes. They yeah. think you're just very girly. I'm like, nope, it's convenient. It's functional. <laughs> it's a very funny thing. Like it's optimal. Yes, it's so optimal. Yes. So, um, so I've been actually reading that and really learning to respect my hormones. And you know what? Like Terry, I can tell you that for the first time in my life since adolescence hit, I've actually had regular cycles. Like, you know, as in regular 30 ish day cycles instead of 45 day yeah. cycles. And it's made a hell of a difference because, you know, like for me, if let's say I have my, my, my bleeding on the 45th day, it means that I start yeah. bloating on the 25th day. So that's 20 days of bloats. Yeah. That's horrible. Yeah. So, you know, one thing I would say is respect the hormones. And what I learned is that the, the master hormone is actually oxytocin because that combats cortisol, mm. which helps your progesterone levels to go up when it's supposed to go up. That helps with your estrogen levels as well during your first to your 19 day. I've been taking a lot of notes. Um, so yes. basically, you know, whenever you're going through a stressful period, go on a what I call an oxytocin hunt. So with my clients, I will actually mm. tell them, okay, write down a list of all the things you need for oxytocin. Okay. It can be cuddling with your dog, cuddling your partner, having great sex, you know, um, go, listening to good stories, you know, looking at great art, whatever fuels you with that sense of oxytocin, do that because you need to keep your cortisol levels as low as possible, as humanly yeah. possible as you can. So that has been my own epiphany about hormones, which I am very, very glad I'm starting to listen to my hormones. How about you? I think you've got a story around it. Yeah. Well, that's it's yeah. interesting, though. It's almost like you yeah. started paying attention mm. to your hormones and yeah. sort of like you said, having respect. Yeah. And you've, you've been able to um, really change what you were experiencing. So there's yeah. something really powerful yes. about making those changes. Mm. I've been through menopause for, for, for years at this mm -hmm. point. And I did, I, I had a really rough go of it in the beginning because nobody was talking about it and I didn't know shit about menopause. Yeah. And I was like, why is sex suddenly painful? Mm. And what the hell? Like, so I did a lot of research mm -hmm. and, you know, like everyone else, I was like, there was that one study that was done about hormone, you know, re yeah. replacing any kind of hormone replacement, mm -hmm. how it was bad for breast cancer, if you have a lot of breast cancer in your yeah. family. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, now that has been 
debunked yep. in that study was massively flawed mm -hmm. and very, very narrow in mm -hmm. its scope. And anyway, but I didn't like everyone who was my age, mm -hmm. we heard that. So there was like 20 years where women just suffered yeah. through yeah. and medical community being like, this is just how it is. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Like who yeah. cares? And the reality I, since I've been last couple of years, I'm fully hormone replacing, mm -hmm. um, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, mm -hmm. that I feel great. And it's helped my sleep. And I mean, no, sex feels great. Mm -hmm. It's not painful anymore. All of these things, because the thing with me is that my sleep was very badly interrupted mm. when I went into perimenopause. And I was right. like, what the hell mm -hmm. is going on? Because I always was a good sleeper. Mm -hmm. Like I always slept seven, eight hours a night. And then my sleep was bad. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, this is really bad for everything. Yeah. And it makes you feel like you're nuts if you can't sleep. So anyway, mm. I was curious of your experience because I do think that it's not just you mm. and it's not just me. Yeah. There's lots of highly capable mm -hmm. women out there mm -hmm. who think of it the same way. I, I yeah. was positive that menopause was going to be easy breezy for me, literally. I was like, it's not going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. Why not me? Why, why shouldn't it just be friggin' easy? Mm -hmm. And I re, you know, in going through it, I was like, wow, I need to slow down. I have to do these things. Like I had to, the pain got, you know, I got to the tipping point yeah. and the pain got so much mm. that I was like, this can't be the quality of my life. I'm too young yeah. to feel this way, mm -hmm. right? I'm too young to be like, not want to have sex. I'm too young yeah. for all of these symptoms. Yeah. So anyway, again, you guys listening. Yeah. I'm not a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. Neither is Dr. P. Mm -hmm. We're talking about this. I am not recommending you do squat. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you my story because I wished that someone had shared their story. And I appreciate you, uh, Perpetua, sharing your story with us. Yeah. Because there are things that we can do, mm -hmm. and we'll put the we'll put the link to Dr. Mindy's book yeah. as well. And mm -hmm. actually, I'm going to have her on my show too. Oh, fantastic! Oh, I love her stuff. Yeah. 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 How did you get turned on to her work? Actually, it's with this lady that I hike with regularly. We're hiking tomorrow, actually. And then she started talking to me about periods and how, you know, like studying about her own cycle helped her. And I told her, you know, like sometimes before my period, I cannot believe what my brain tells me because it's a bad place yeah. to be in. And she said, yes. And I told her, you know, it's before my period. I get so clumsy. Sometimes my contact lens bottle projectiles to the other end of the bathroom. And I don't understand. And she says, yeah, women get more clumsy during that time. And she's, and because I had told her about my own fasting experience, I've been fasting for about 269 weeks, you know, it was a long time. Um, and, um, wow. and, and so she said, Oh, you know, there's this thing about fasting with regards to being a woman. And I was like, show me the book, I read the book. And I was like, that's an easier way to live, you know, like, so on some yeah. days I can fast less. Hey, great. I mean, like, I'm not completely strict about fasting every day like when i'm on holiday i eat long hours when i'm being social i eat very long hours but generally you know, it keeps my own adhd brain in check so i give myself a certain number of hours to eat when i am just being on my own so what is your eating window so my eating right. window is about between five to eight hours so um so yeah. and and when i read that i was like oh you know there's some days when i should just bring on the cups i mean generally i would listen to my body to bring on the cups but some days I would second guess myself because, you know, is it right? Is it wrong? Because of there's so much conflicting information out there, which makes a brain like mine overthink at times. So having the yeah. science behind it and realizing that I don't have to suffer through 15 to 20 days of bloat a month is was basically the big impetus for me because the bloat was big, you know, like people would say, I can't see it. I'm like, I can feel it. It is painful. Yeah. I'm carrying around yeah. something hurt and swollen and it's awful. Yeah. Right. Mm. And I don't want to feel that way. Yeah. Well, this is amazing. Um, thank you so much mm -hmm. for all this stuff. Thanks yeah. for spending so much time with us today. Yeah. Tell us where we can find you. So you can find me on my website, perpetuania.com. And I also write on Mind Body Green, which I will be sending this to Terry. And you can also buy my workbook, This Is What Matters, which was published by Simon & Schuster last year. 
and it's a workbook on helping you to navigate and your priorities, especially after a crisis. Um, figure out what stands in the way and how to cartograph your map to get you where you want to be. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. B. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you, Terry.